session. Um, Wisdom Kings were kind of a thing that I came to fall in love with uh, as I was starting work at LACMA with uh, Hollis Goodall. Um, while she dropped all of these books on my desk, uh, I was reading through, trying to really start to understand all of these names I was reading, what roles they played in Buddhism, and the rap bowl, I was always interested in them. I'm like, I know a lot of religions, they, they, you know, they talk about peace, they talk about tranquility, they talk about respect to one another. Why is this deity holding a sword? Um, why is this deity got this really cruel looking face, a ferocious visage? And so I decided to do a little bit more reading into it, and I decided to write a major research paper on a sculpture in LACMA's collection of Fudo Myoho. So before we talk about the Myo'o, we do have to establish where they came from. Um, the Myo'o came out of a esoteric tradition of Buddhism. Um, it's called Vajrayana. And Vajrayana is a branch off of Mahayana Buddhism that came out of northern India around, uh, the, around the turn of the millennium. Um, well, about it really started coming out of there around the turn of millennium into China and into uh, the Himalayas. Uh, and esoteric Buddhism was, very, was first developed around the 8th century CE um, as a way to incorporate tantric and uh, Vedic practices into Buddhist thought. Uh, the symbol that usually comes into uh, esoteric Buddhism, you'll see on the left here, is called a Vajra. In um, Japanese, it's called a Kongo. Uh, Kongo, it roughly translates to mean diamond, um, but it is something that is indestructible and irresistible. And the Vajra, it comes in, mul in multiple uh, variants. You've got a single pronged, you've got a three pronged, you've got a five pronged, and you will see them as the handles for various implements used in esoteric Buddhism. Now, esoteric Buddhism, in addition to using implements uh, that you would strike the ground with or other, um, other sort of practices, you would also use something called mandalas. And mandalas are uh, cosmological diagrams that you use to guide your mind to finding a sort of oneness with the deity that you have chosen to be your tutelary deity. If there's one thing I want to say before we go any further, if there's things that you're not understanding, just put up your hand or shout out a question and I'll try to further explain it in a way that's easier for you to understand. Now, esoteric Buddhism apocryphally was, was um, communicated to the um, human monk Nagarjuna by the Bodhisattva Kongosattva, um, or his uh, Sanskrit name is Vajrasattva. And he basically took a sutra that was communicated to him by Mahavairochana, um, and he took that and communicated it in terms that were easy to understand to Nagarjuna, who in turn turned it into a text. Now more realistically, esoteric Buddhism was most likely created, developed by a group of monks working out of Nalanda. Nalanda is located in northeastern uh, India, and it is one of the largest uh, universities and schools of thought, places of learning in, uh, in that area. It was a university from around the 5th century to about the 12th century, and it has recently just been reopened not on the historical site, but as a, uh, as a university with the same name and with the same mission in mind. Which brings us specifically to the Wisdom Kings. They are a Vajrayana, an esoteric Buddhism specific group of deities. Uh, they were, so they are wrathful deities who protect the tenets of Buddhism and they bring the wanderers back to the Buddha. Now, you might wonder, why would they have such ferocious faces? And that is essentially for them to grab somebody who would be wandering away from the Buddhist faith. They would grab them, 
and scare them to be back into the Buddhist fold. Now the now they were a development. They were a sort of a amalgamation of two groups of deity in Ma and um, Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, the Lokapala, uh, who are more so, you might know them as the four cardinal guardian kings. Um, in, in Japanese, you had the Shiten no, um, Bishimon Ten, uh, Tam, and then you've got Tamon Ten, uh, Zoko Ten, uh, Jikoku Ten. That group of four deities um, are known as the Shitenno, and they are the Lokapala, and those are Mahayana Buddhist deities. The other group is the Dvarapala, and Dvarapala were monstrous creatures that were placed at the entrances to temples um, or places of worship in Jainism, in Hinduism, and in Buddhism. Uh, specifically in uh, northern, North Indian Buddhism, uh, they were placed outside places of worship, and they became affiliated with the uh, Ni O. Uh, you might rec you might recognize when you go to a temple in uh, Japan, you see two figures on either side of the gate, one standing with his mouth open, and one standing with his mouth closed. And those are the two Deva kings who serve as protectors of the entrance, and they are the Varapala. These two were brought together, amalgamated, to create the Vajrayanic group of deities known as the Myoho. And here's one of the earlier examples of that. You can see um, one of the defining features of an esoteric wrathful deity is multiple arms, multiple heads, and uh, tools of both uh, destruction and of rebuilding the mind. So the very first is probably the most popular of the wisdom kings in Japan. Um, almost every sect of Buddhism has some form of Fudo Myo involved with it. Uh, Fudo Myo, his name directly translates to the immovable wisdom king. And he, the role that he plays in a grouping of deities called the Godai Myo, the five great wisdom kings, he plays the role of the center. He plays the role of their chief. And the reason that he plays the role of their chief is that he emanates specifically from the cosmological Buddha. Now, going back two months, does anybody remember the name of the cosmological <laughs> Buddha, the one that is everything sort of emanates from? Uh, Siddhartha Gautama was the founder. He was the historical Buddha. The one that makes the power fist. Dainichi. Um, Dainichi's name also is Mahavairachana in Sanskrit. So Fudo Myo, um, he, his name in Sanskrit is Achalanatha Vidyaraja. Vidyaraja, it translates to wisdom king or bright king or a king of lum um, luminance or a king of light. And Fudo Myo is actually a derivative from Shiva. Um, Shiva, kind of in the forms that Shiva took, Shiva eventually became the very first depiction of Ashwagandha. Um, you can see he, um, Shiva holds in his hand a lasso, and then sometimes in the other hand he'll hold a sword. And those are tools that you will see being held by Fudo Myo in the future. To the right is Budong Mingwong. Um, that is the Chinese version of Achuanatha. And here you start to see a little bit more of what Fudo Myo looks like. The blue skin, the, like the blue gray, blue black skin, the sword in the hand, the lasso in the other. And you start to see this iconography moving from northern India into China, and then from China, you'll see it going into Japan. Yes. <laughs> yes, these are flames. Um, the root of the flames were actually it's with Garuda, um, the purifying flames of Garuda. 
Yes. Does the uh, blue skin mean anything in particular? Um, it's, it kind of follows along with the scriptural, uh, rep the, the way that the scriptures um, describe him. Uh, a lot of these sutras and a lot of the scriptures talking about the wisdom kings will mention certain iconograph iconograph I can't say the word, iconographical features. Um, Fudo Myoho specifically has 19 um, signs. Remember how um, the Buddha, enlightened Buddha, had 32 signs? Um, that included the bump on his head, the, um, the tuft of hair between his eyes. Um, Fudo Myoho also became such an important deity in Japan that he was assigned 19 signs that had to be included in every depiction. Which kind of brings us to the Japanese depiction here. As you can see, uh, you have both sitting and standing versions of Fudo Myoho. Uh, the one on the left, you can see at the Toji, uh, as part of a um, massive three-dimensional mandala. Um, this was based on pictures brought back by Kukai to Japan in the early 9th century. This one in the middle is actually a um, depiction of what's known as the Namakiri Fudo. Um, Namakiri Fudo is actually a sculpture of him is kept in the Nan In in uh, on Koyasan. And the reason that this sculpture is so important um, is Namakiri means wave cutting. And as Kukai was traveling from China, where he picked up all of this information, where he became a Shingon um, monk, as he was returning, there was this massive storm on the ocean. And he prayed to Fudo to save him. And Fudo came and using his sword, cut the waves and the waves became peaceful. And they were able to pass safely to Japan from China. Um, so in that way, Fudo became Kukai's tutelary deity. Um, Kukai had this very close relationship with Fudo himself. The second time that Namakiri Fudo features prominently in Japanese history is during the Mongol invasions, um, during the 12th um, century. Um, 12th century? 13th century. Um, 13th century. And as uh, these Mongol invasions were coming, they realized that, oh, if the Mongols actually hit shore, uh, we're in a lot of danger because the Mongols were a formidable force of fighters. So they prayed to Namakiri Fudo asking, um, please deliver us. And the resulting typhoon um, is believed to be a um, kamikaze, um, the uh, wind of the gods, the div divine wind. And so they believe that this sculpture specifically sent that wind to rout the Mongol invasion. This third one on the right uh, is the first original depiction of uh, Fudo in um, Japan. These, the, these two are based on Chinese predecessors, but this one was developed by a uh, monk named Enchin. And Enchin, in a vision, in a dream, he saw an image of a large standing golden Fudo. And he was so moved by this dream that he had was and he was so moved by this dream that he had a painter um, depict what he saw in the dream. And so this is the very first original depiction of Fudo Myoho in Japan, based completely on ideas of a Japanese monk. We actually call this the yellow Fudo, the key Fudo. And there are two other Fudo depictions in painting.